they would use the black arts to try to gain an advantage over their enemies. Now, who is in charge of magicians? Does God sanctify that, or does God condemn that? All right. Now, listen. This is Constantine. Constantine was a brilliant politician as well as a general. Constantine had a magician that went with him wherever he went and before they went into battle. So the same time that he had this vision, before they went into battle, he consulted with his magician to see how this would go. Did God give him this vision? Think about this. Because in this life and on this earth, there are only two powers that control the supernatural. That's the power of God, and that's the power of Satan. Does Satan have miraculous working abilities? Okay? And so, Constantine went forth under the sign. Before that, before he went into battle, he marched his entire army through the river. On this side, they're pagan. He marched them through the river, said, you're baptized, you're Christians now. On the other side, they're Christians. Is that how this works? But through that, he was able to unite the Christians and the pagans. And through compromise, this was the beginning of the great falling away that Paul talked about. The question is, is as this falling away happened and his power was solidified and Constantine became the emperor of Rome, he started to make decrees. And in one year, it's 5 what? 38? 538. What happened then? Any ideas? What started it? What was the thing that actually happened? Chuck, do you know? Can you say it? I can, but it takes time, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, what I'll tell you is, you got smartphones? When you go home today for lunch, speak in your phone, say, what happened in 538 AD? See if it brings anything up. But, in 538 AD, this is where you have the solidifying of the power of the Emperor of Rome, now not just to be the Emperor of secular Rome, but he also was in charge of the church. And that in this, you have now the rise of the man of sin, the son of perdition. So if you go 538 AD and take 1260 years, do you know what you come to? 1798. Do you know what happened in 1798? How many of you guys heard of Napoleon? Okay. Napoleon sent his general, Berthier, into Rome, into the Vatican, and took the Pope captive. And the Bible talks to you about in Revelation that this beast <coughs> received a deadly wound, right? And the deadly wound will be healed. Do you know when that deadly wound took place? After the 1260 years, in 1798. So, what this is telling you when it comes to God's true church is that, number one, you know that the church that Constantine started definitely is not God's true church, right? You also find out that that church and the, the leadership and the mouthpiece of that church, the Bible speaks about that as well, and it doesn't speak well about it. So that church is out. So what other church does it leave? It leaves the rest of Protestantism, right? Where did Protestants come from? They came from the Catholic Church. All that word Catholic means is universal, right? So, 1260 years, God's true church was in hiding. Any Protestant church that was openly, uh, uh, how would you phrase that? That was actually an open organization couldn't be God's true remnant church. Does that make sense to you guys? Look at the time periods. Go back and look at whatever Protestant church see when they were organized. Because during this time period, 
can't fit God's description of his true church. So there's a way mark. There's more way marks than that. Okay? What you need to understand is that when this man of sin comes to the scene, this son of perdition, and this whole institution that we still have here today, there's another point in time in history where God steps in and he sees that his truth has been trampled underfoot and that the truths contained in his word have been so lost that even history was able to see it and they call that time period the dark ages. And God steps in and God brings about the Protestant Reformation. What were they protesting against? Well, they were protesting against the abuses and the unbiblical teachings of that organization. Okay? Now, what you need to realize is as time goes by with these Protestant churches, same thing happened to them. They started off with truth, and they would move to a certain point, and when their leader died, they stuck right there instead of moving forward. Instead of moving forward. So God would raise somebody else up. They would bring out biblical truth. Their leader would die, and they would be stuck there. And they would start that denomination. Okay? This is why this church is called Babylon the Great Whore, the mother of what? What you need to understand is it's focusing on the doctrine and the teaching of these churches. Is it true? Is it biblical? And can it be sustained by Scripture alone? And that's why you have so many Protestant denominations, and that's why you have so many different ideas and interpretations of doctrine and what the Scriptures say. So, was this God's plan? Is God the author of confusion? If you look at the churches today, are we a confused bunch? That's not God's plan. So again, always remember that God has always had a remnant people and a remnant church that held true to the Bible and the truths contained there. So as we continue on, they overcame him, verse 11 of chapter 12, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, and woe to you, the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. It says, Now the dragon was, uh, or saw that he had been cast to the earth, and he persecuted the woman who uh, gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, to her place where she is nursed for a time, and times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Verse 16, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. That's a lot, and it's like, what are they talking about? So, the woman. You know the woman is God's church and God's people, right? You also know that you have this 1260-year time period. That starts in 538 A.D. and goes to 1798, right? I told you that, and, and you know it, it's history about the Protestant Reformation. What were they protesting? They were protesting the abuses of the Mother Church. Martin Luther, you remember that guy? When he nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Church of Wittenberg, did he want to start another church? Did he want to start the Lutheran Church? He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. That was the only church, the universal church. They wanted to see if the church could be, again, reformed. But when it wasn't, and it couldn't, then you had the rise of Protestantism, and you had the rise of all these denominations. Now, something was going on on another part of this earth around 1798. You know what it was? There was one country that was coming up. It was a new country. 
It was a country that was not heavily populated. It was a great wilderness that when the Europeans looked at it, they were thinking, compared to how crowded this is, it's a great place. Okay, now, what does the Bible say that the, the woman fled where? Into the wilderness, into an uninhabited place. In our day today, what is the bastion? Oops. What is the bastion of Protestantism on the earth? The United States, right? For all of our flaws and all of our badness, we are still the greatest country that exports Bibles, scriptures. We are also one of the, the greatest um, uh, charity givers of any other nation. Okay? But this country was raised, and, and, and if you disagree, just look at your history books. This country was, was founded, was brought up in the belief of God and the belief of the Bible in the Protestant work, work ethic. Was it that way from everybody who came here? No. Okay. But let's go to Washington, D.C. Look at the things that are inscribed on the walls of the Supreme Court. Go into any of the government buildings and look at the biblical inscriptions still there today that they still can't get rid of. They'd like to. So the woman flees into the wilderness, okay? And for 1260 years she's in hiding. After this 1260 year time period ends, she's able to come out of hiding. There, in another part of Revelation, speaks about this lamb like power that has two horns like a lamb, comes out of the earth. And it, it, how does it say it? It does something like a lamb and it speaks as a dragon. Can't remember the verse. Speaks like a lamb and act like a dragon. Okay, so you see this is the same time period that we're talking about here. All right? Now, in this time period, 1798, what's the only country on earth that's starting to come up and rise into its ascendancy as a new nation. A nation that has lamb-like government, but eventually will speak as a dragon. And the only country that fits that is the United States, the bastion of Protestantism. Okay? So your second wave, Mark Donald, what happened, buddy? Somebody run into our... Uh, all Our thing outside? So, verse 15 again, the servant spewed water out of the mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Ricky, do you have the King James? No, I've got the King James. Who has the King James? Can somebody I've read? Got, uh, you just got one. Can you read uh, 12 verse 17 out of the King James? And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And these are the last two waymarks in this chapter about distinguishing God's true church. Okay? Number one, the dragon will make war with it. How do they overcome? Blood of the Lamb, war of the testimony. But what is the description of these people? They keep the commandments of God and what? What's the next part after? Have the testimony of Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus? Spirit of prophecy. It says somewhere else in the book of Revelation. It is the spirit of prophecy, right? So, God's true church will be a church that teaches all the commandments of God. Not just nine of them, or not just eight of them and taking two in. Uh, but, yeah. So, way marks. You want to see God's true church? Find a church that teaches all the commandments of God. You go on from Revelation 12 to Revelation 14. And it says, when Jesus comes, before he comes, God's people or his church will be proclaiming a unique and special message. 
And it is symbolized by three angels. Do you know what that first angel's message is? Worship God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea. Isn't that a direct quotation from the fourth commandment? So, before Christ comes, there will be a people who are telling the world to worship God the proper and right way. And what way is that? It is according to what God has ordained, not according to man. Amen. Now listen. <laughs> I ran out of time. Okay, well, we'll close, and I will do this again. Amen. Okay. So, our closing hymn this morning is going to be hymn number what? 223.
Christ.